Hello, I'm Peter Singer, Senior Fellow and Strategist at New America, and I am delighted that you've joined us for this discussion on the future of information warfare, part of the larger conference, uh, the Future Security Forum. We have a fantastic um, group of experts for this discussion today. Uh, we're joined by Dewan Lee. Uh, he is CEO of Vast OSINT, which is a new firm working to find, fix, and finish information pollution. He's uh, previously worked with organizations that range from the Naval Postgraduate School and the University of San Francisco to Zignal. We're also joined by um, John Spikerman, uh, and he's had a long career representing the United States uh, as part of the State Department around the world, and he is presently Chief of the Russia Directorate with the Global Engagement Center with the State Department. Next, we're joined by um, Candace Rondeau. Uh, she has worked for organizations that range from the Washington Post to the International Crisis Group. And she is now a colleague uh, who is director of the Future Frontiers Project at New America, as well as a fellow professor of practice at Arizona State University. And um, finally, uh, we're joined by um, Mike McConnell. He is a former Vice Admiral in the United States Navy. And during his distinguished career, he served in roles that range from Director of the National Security Agency to the US Director of National Intelligence. And presently, he is Executive Director of Cyber Florida, which he'll speak to as a program that provides cybersecurity education um, in support of the Florida uh, Department of Education and university system down there. So a really great group. Um, so I'd like to begin with a question that both takes us back, but also takes us forward in this topic. Um, one of the notable aspects of 9-11 20 years back was the shared sense of not just the facts, what happened, but also unity on the problem set, unity in terms of the need to act on terrorism. Will there be any more such 9-11 moments in a world of social media polarization and conspiracy theory online? That is, will we be able to come together again around a shared sense of facts and a shared sense of threat? Uh, so Duan, why don't you take this question first? Thank you, Peter. I am exceptionally thrilled to be in this panel. Um, I'd like to start with a very simple observation and um, with 9-11, we saw this growth of what we call transnational terrorism. And we used to use the phrase, the democratization of violence to explain this kind of patterns. And um, in a way, what we are facing right now is ironically the democratization of propaganda and information pollution. The reason being is become so much cheap to create inauthentic content and also there is this growing industry that monetizes such content and traffic. To me, this is perhaps the most pernicious threat we are facing at this point. And um, I'm gonna start with three additional observations. So I just talked about the democratization of propaganda, but also now we have this normalization of information pollution that is whether it is between groups or between states, what is the most routine aspect of conflict and competition? And I would offer that, that is really in the information environment plus cyber domain. Number three is the concentration of what I call data weaponization. And that is the more resources you have, the better you can weaponize this kind of patterns and this power is so concentrated right now in a few private entities and autocratic regimes. And this is why a lot of liberal democracies are essentially struggling to compete more effectively in this space. And uh, so, so would we see a 9-11 like moment in the information environment? Um, I don't wanna be a doomsday guy, but that is what, what keeps me awake at night and I feel like, you know, there is this evolution of information weaponization. So 
10 years ago, you know, 20 years ago, we had 9-11. 10 years ago, we had the Arab Spring. And this is where information sharing was incredibly empowering and also enabling certain movements. And I think this made a lot of autocratic regimes really, you know, they become really afraid of this potentiality. And what happened was, hey, we need to recognize the same techniques, the same data to preserve our political monopoly. And unwittingly, this created a highly diversified and also highly distributed echo, you know, set of echo chambers, right? Now, think about the first wave, think about the second wave, what we call the backsliding of democracy, and imagine those two waves essentially leading to a 9-11-like moment in the information environment and essentially transitioning to the physical world, like the way we've seen in 2010 and 11. I think that's what I'm afraid of the most at this point. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Peter. Thank you. How about you, John? What are your thoughts on this? Sure. I, I think if we're going to have that kind of unity moment uh, where, you know, shared truth uh, among a large population and so on, we need to do a better job of explaining and educating our publics about the nature of disinformation operations uh, as kind of a fundamental resiliency building or, or, or media literacy when we talk about counter disinformation work. Uh, right now, we have a lot of disinformation actors, including Russia uh, and others, who are very good at individual narratives, uh, creating these emotional connections between audiences and those narratives. Uh, and, and we know from observation and psychological studies that, that when, when audiences get that emotional attachment to a narrative, even when it's false, even when it's proven false and debunked and fact checked, they are very reluctant to let that go. So even though our fact checkers have gotten very good and we have established ways for audiences to educate themselves on the truth of individual narratives, uh, it doesn't always work uh, because disinformation actors are so effective at dividing people. Uh, and a lot of their operations are designed and intended to sow confusion and sow distrust and, and um, trigger emotionally uh, societies on specific issues that, that spark those emotional reactions. Uh, but we also know from, from, from other psychological studies that people are more likely to reject false information if they understand the nature of a disinformation operation, if they understand, for example, that a source of news might be directed by a foreign intelligence, foreign intelligence uh, uh, agency that is dedicated to the mission of fooling foreign publics or, or making fools of them. If, if people can better understand that, they're more likely to reject bad information, they're more likely to uh, or I should say less likely to, to absorb and connect with disinformation. Uh, and then through that process, you have a better chance of having a shared truth or, or shared set of facts. If people understand that some of those uh, alleged facts are part of disinformation operations to fool them. Uh, but so far, we're only beginning in this area. Uh, and if we look to the future, uh, we have a lot of work to do there to to expose and explain the the, the nature of disinformation operations, not just the 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 uh, falseness or 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 truth of of individual narratives or facts. Candice, one of the things that is interesting I find about your work is that you've touched on topics that range from. Um, far right extremism to, as John was referencing, Russian information operations. So with that kind of um, insight, what are your thoughts on whether we might see a similar moment of coming together? And, and maybe an add on is how would you project that groups like that would operate against such an event? Yeah, really good question. I mean, at Future Frontlines, a lot of our work does focus on um, trying to understand the mechanics of information warfare and trying to expose those mechanics so that people can understand how influence works, right? How, how um, different actors, whether they're states or individuals who work for states or have some sort of tenuous connection to them, influence um, the way people think about a lot of the complex problems that we have today. And I think the way, you know, to answer the question, um, you know, very quickly, Quick answer, will we have another moment like 9-11 where we have a shared sense of uh, facts and truth? I think the answer is no. Um, I think we already see, we have the answer in, in the form of the January 6th 
uh, breach of the Capitol and kind of reinterpretation uh, of facts by you know various members of our political class as well as those who were there. Um, there's there are kind of these alternate universes and alternate narratives being promoted now on other platforms, right? That um, are less moderated. So uh, that's Gab, Rumble, um, you know, the New Parlor. Um, those that model of doing business is growing unchecked. And so the answer to the question somewhat depends on um, sort of I think sort of three factors. Some are on screen and some are off screen. In the off screen category, we just have these larger structural dy dynamics that for the next 20 years we're going to be coping with, which is demographic change, um, climate change, and technological disruption. And all three of those factors are going to incentivize uh, certain states, especially those that are extremely energy dependent from fossil fuels, um, to protect you know, their interests, protect their wealth, protect their capital, protect their elite positions, and to use information uh, as a weapon to do that. And we've already started to see that with Russia for sure. Uh, that is definitely a motivation here, obviously, is response to the Ukraine um, sanctions that imposed as a result of, of their incursion in Ukraine. So that's just one, you know, structural factor that we have to deal with and we have to contend with. Um, that's something that's completely off screen that, you know, both governments and institutions and organizations are all struggling with. On screen, um, as I mentioned, we have this fundamental challenge of um, a, an industry model, you know, that is predicated on the idea um, that privacy doesn't matter. Uh, that in fact, um, you know, individuals are a surface unto themselves. Communities are a surface to be exploited unto themselves. Um, what's problematic about that is you have two different models now of um, sort of online understanding of truth and information. One is the authoritarian sort of China, uh, Russia model of you know, complete state surveillance, right? The other is the sort of capital driven model um, of, you know, data driven surveillance through capital concentration in the big tech industry. And that's, you know, right now, that's the predominant American model. There is a middle way that Europe, I think, is trying to kind of explore um, with its protections for privacy, but it's not there yet. It hasn't matured. So these three kind of competing models, um, unfortunately, there's no one government that has really gotten to grips with the scale of what's needed there in terms of regulation uh, and pushback and kind of containing um, the overreach, either of governments or or technologists. Um, and, you know, more importantly, while we talk a lot about media literacy and, and sort of a general understanding of, you know, how disinformation works, very important. But the reality is um, the model is such that if you're a YouTube influencer, or whether you're a micro influencer or a big influencer, you're making money. And um, there's real, you know, sort of monetary value in spreading disinformation and misinformation. And there's also social value. There's social cachet for people. Until we change those incentives, I think it's going to be really difficult to have a sort of shared sense of the reality. Thank you. Admiral, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think uh, uh, if you look back in our history, usually uh, some event that brought us together was physical. Um, uh, the attack on the Lusitania in World War One. Uh, Pearl Harbor attack, 9-11. Um, I think it's an entirely new dimension in the information age. I agree with um, much of what the, the other panelists have said. <clears throat> um, I, I believe from my perspective, uh, sitting in an in a educational institution focused on uh, cybersecurity education and research and so on, that education is the answer. Um, I'm an older guy. Um, there was no mention of communications or technology when I was in secondary school. Uh, I came to learn about it through uh, 30 years in the Navy when I had to deliver information, sensitive, time sensitive information to ships at sea. So I, I gained an understanding of the process. It wasn't until I went to be the director of the National Security Agency that I was faced with the issue of um, how it looks in the future and how you would develop a a signals intelligence capability to protect the nation and so on. And what I've observed, particularly in my current role, is uh, American public just doesn't understand. Uh, there is no focus on digital literacy or cyber citizenship. Now we, we quickly go start down a path 
uh, referred to as civics education. And then you get into the political debate, depending on your political persuasion of what you should teach or not teach. But in, in my view, uh, having a much better fundamental understanding of what it is, how does communications work? How do communications work? What's the flow path? What are the timelines? Uh, when I was a youngster, uh, to put money in a bank, would I'd go down to my little local bank and give them my $3 and I'd put an entry in my passbook. Today, you can move uh, $10 billion from Tokyo and uh, to New York and complete the transaction in 30 milliseconds. It is so fundamentally different. And I, I don't think that the American uh, public fully understands the dimension. And here's the way I think about it. We have put everything that's important online to include our critical infrastructure for energy or electric power or banking or whatever it is. And we've offered that up to nation states who wish us harm to provide them remote control of those inf infrastructures. And I think we're gonna see that more and more. Are we gonna get to a point that is so catastrophic that we have a 9-11 come together moment? I don't know. Uh, but I know from my perspective, education of uh, youngsters in secondary schools and colleges and the citizens at large is a huge shortfall that we must address. Great points on um, uh, all, all those different perspectives. Um, I'd like to follow up with a question of um, what personal lesson have you taken from the last 20 years and how it applies in particular to your work uh, related to information threats. So uh, why don't we go uh, back around the horn. Duan, start us off first. Yeah, so um, I was in grad school when 9-11 happened and um, my training was in quantitative modeling and political movements. And I was very fortunate to get my first teaching job at a government institution. And um, I was incredibly lucky to work with some of the people who were trying to fix our system after 9-11. And I remember two large conversations. One was that I'm pretty sure everyone is familiar with this concept of fusion cells. So after the 9-11 commission, we had to essentially decentralize information sharing and intelligence sharing. And we set up a large number of fusion cells that were coordinating the federal government with state authorities, local authorities between DIC and law enforcement, DOD and whatnot. And McChrystal, you know, I, I did work for him on numerous locations. He was essentially one of the pioneers of actualizing this model downrange. And to me, we are facing a more scalable threat in the information environment where we don't have this connective tissue both laterally and vertically. For example, think about this information. Um, I think the federal government is doing, made a lot of progress, right? But in the last election, I was trying to support different state governments and local election monitoring groups and whatnot. They are poorly resourced, poorly organized to combat this information that was undermining our election integrity. So I feel like, you know, we are approaching the same inflection point, And that is, unless we build this connective tissue, both laterally and vertically, I don't think we'll be able to fight effectively against this highly scalable and pernicious threat factor at this point. And let me give you some data points to appreciate why this is so critical for us to reorganize how we respond in the information environment. And um, I was speaking at another JSL event last week, and somebody asked me, so what do you recommend we do to compete more effectively in the information environment? Because it appears that that's where we are yielding the most at this point, especially against the Chinese Communist Party and the Kremlin. And I completely concur with that assessment. So my sort of you know, uh, recommendation to them was, look, in the past 20 years, we've become so good at moving, shooting, and communicating against transnational 
terrorist organizations and also severing their support ties from certain autocratic regimes. I think the same principles apply to information warfare, except that we're not so good at moving, shooting, and communicating in the digital environment. So we have certain strong muscle memory already. We just have to transfer some of those lessons to do the same in the information environment. To me, that is really connected tissue, vertical, lateral, and also our most forward deployed assets and sensors to be able to move and shoot and communicate more effectively in the information environment. Great. John, what lesson have you taken personally from the events of the last 20 years? I think one thing that, stri that strikes me as I, as I look back over, you know, specifically Russia, because that's my current focus, um, looking at their uh, successes and failures with, with disinformation operations uh, is, is the lesson that the, the capabilities and the, the, the talents of a disinformation actor, or in our case, a disinformation adversary, are not static. Uh, they grow and they develop and they evolve over time. Um, certainly when you just look at the strategies, uh, or even sometimes in a sense the, the, the tools of disinformation, um, you do see a lot of similarities uh, going back over time. Uh, certainly with Russia, you can go back to the, the time of the Cold War and the Soviet Union, look at the, the active measures, as we called them in the 1980s, of uh, Soviet disinformation operations that, that attempted to spread rumors about uh, the AIDS epidemic or, or crack cocaine on the streets of the U.S. tied to um, you know, notorious conspiracy theories about the U.S. intelligence community, uh, things like that. You can see echoes of that uh, general strategy uh, in the way Russia operates today with its disinformation, using proxy sites uh, to launder information and allow more credible sourcing. Uh, of course, in the 1980s, that was done with traditional media, newspapers, today it's done on the web. That overall strategy and approach has stayed the same, but the, the capability uh, and the specific tactics, uh, we've seen a, a, a pretty significant evolution uh, in just the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years uh, when looking specifically at Russia. If you look at the narratives that they tried to uh, inject into U.S. politics or U.S. civic discourse, uh, I would say, looking at that, there's been a, um, a, a degree of development towards a better understanding of those emotional issues that, that trigger American audiences. Uh, you can also look at Russian interference in, in other countries, democratic uh, institutions or electoral processes, uh, where, uh, say, 10 to 15 years ago, the um, kind of first uh, initial steps by, by Russia to influence conversations on, on social media, uh, you might more often describe those as ham-fisted, uh, whereas today they're using a much greater sense of what issues resonate and what lines of argument resonate against certain publics uh, to get at that strategy that they've had for a while uh, to sow distrust, uh, um, weaken social cohesion, um, create and foster distrust in government and democracy. Uh, but now they're using technology, uh, they're using specific ways of building narratives in a much more skilled way. Uh, and I think as social media evolves, uh, we can expect uh, actors like Russia to continue on that trend. Uh, Candace raised a, a very excellent point about uh, increasing numbers of social media platforms, uh, moving away from those big platforms like Facebook and Twitter where that have millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of users uh, into uh, other applications and platforms that, that have a smaller number. Uh, and that's harder to reach, harder to understand um, uh, for those who are countering disinformation, but easier for adversaries to um, embed their, their false narratives in. Uh, so, you know, certainly that, you know, lesson of the ability of an adversary to evolve and improve over time, uh, that's the lesson that we draw and that's, that's what, we, what we need to think about when we think about the challenges of the next 10 or 20 years. Candice? Yeah, I mean, so all of, all of um, us have kind of been making kind of the same point, which is um, the United States is vulnerable, right? Europe is vulnerable. Many countries around the world, they're just vulnerable. They're vulnerable for a number of reasons. Um, you know, chief among them is just the regulatory environment around information. Um, and then also because of the emerging dynamics with very rapidly evolving technologies that again, I think you know, neither governments nor institutions nor even society or, or industry really has a full understanding of the kind of um, the, the long tail um, impact scale, which you've written about, of course, 
uh, in Burn In, which I think is just a beautiful book um, that you know kind of t tells a great story about um, you know the unintended consequences of rapidly evolving information uh, technologies and, and how they fit into our lives. For me, you know, I was a reporter, a cub reporter with the Daily News in New York on 9-11. Um, I did not have a cell phone, okay? <laughs> that's, that's how long ago this was. It, you know, very common not to have a cell phone. Uh, most of the reporting you did is on your pay phone. Uh, and I, I remember that day as one in which I, I felt, and I'm sure other reporters uh, on the day in New York felt uh, disconnected from uh, an enormously, you know, challenging information events that we just couldn't get our arms around. Today, obviously, we're just work operating in a different environment. And I think one of my key lessons is um, you have to expect that some of these technology, technology changes, even though people are sort of downgrading the role of legacy media, legacy media is always going to be there. Legacy media is always going to be part of the information sphere. And so the question is, does legacy media catch up with the story of reporting on information warfare? Um, and I think, you know, that's one of the reasons why we kind of began our program is to help um, people understand that, you know, this is this is literally a war uh, that does have that has no front uh, and it has to be reported on in that way. It has to be tackled in that way. Um, so the big lesson is, I think, you know, that we also don't know what we don't know. That is to say, um, there are growing synergies between the way states like China and Russia and then other very powerful political elites are beginning to leverage information to their advantage. And we already, you know, we've seen that in the last year, certainly over this you know, 2020 election period. You could almost call it like sort of like um, those who kind of were in junior high in, in, in 2016 have now graduated high school. And now we're going to kind of get onto a university level in terms of leveraging that attack surface. Um, and I think that's really dangerous. That synergy uh, is something that could be controlled with greater regulation or reporting more transparency, but we're just not there yet. Amara, what is the lesson that you've taken personally from the last 20 years? One of the biggest lessons that I've uh, learned in the past 20 years and actually started when I was in war college years and years ago <clears throat> And that is a large organization established with a mission and a focus and a positions and authorities and whatever will choose failure over change. Uh, I've witnessed it over and over again. I'm, my beloved Navy uh, refused to build carriers in the 30s, um, battleships forever until Pearl Harbor. Uh, the US Air Force refused to embrace drones, even though directed by the president until the Chief of the Air Force, Secretary of the Air Force were fired and new leadership was put in place. So the, my point is, unless you force change, large organizations are gonna choose failure. 9-11 lessons learned, I was a product of uh, the aftermath 9-11 as a director of, of national intelligence. And uh, what they said was a lack of willingness to share information, which was true. Um, it, there was no incentive. The, the community was taught need to know, came out of uh, breaking Nazi Germany code in World War II and the Japanese code on the other side of the world. Uh, need to know, protect sources message. That's the whole ethos and culture of my community. My belief is we have to change that to responsibility to share. If there's information that's gonna protect US banking or a bridge in Seattle or whatever it is, and you are aware of that, you need to figure out a way to get the information to the people that need it so they can actually do something about it. So the lesson learned for me is don't wait for us to magically find how to deal with this. This is a leadership issue. We have to rethink authorities and roles and missions and uh, partnerships. If we're gonna address this issue over time it has to be a collective defense we we know how to do physical defense we have authorities and resources and and rules and so on but this is a borderless problem and if you're going to solve a problem where someone uh, in another part of the world can touch critical infrastructure in the united states operated by a private sector entity it's going to take a collective effort between that private sector, others in that sector, and the U.S. government to share information at network speed. 
I, I refer to this as collective defense or collective security. It, ha it must move at network speed. And the only way we're going to get there is leadership. I go back to uh, Goldwater Nichols to change the Department of Defense. Department of Defense was studied every year for its history. And when Goldwater was intended on, on forcing jointness, the Secretary of the Army, Navy, uh, and the Air Force, uh, as well as the service chiefs for all four services, testified against it. And then we had it passed anyway. The president signed it. We had our first dust up, dust up in the Gulf War. I was the fly on the wall as the intelligence officer for the Joint Chiefs to go to the old office of the Congress and listen to the service chiefs say, "Go water Nichols is the greatest thing that ever happened." So the department chose failure over change until they had some forcing function to cause them to embrace the necessary change. I think that's where we are on this issue. Whether it's education or outreach or changing authorities or collective defense among the private sector and the public sector, new authorities for intelligence committee, all that has to be addressed if we're gonna get ahead of this problem. I'm hoping that we do, but I think it will boil down to statesmanship or maybe a better way to say it's leadership. Where we've had crisis in our past some leader stepped up to make the case. I heard a speech last night. I went to a uh, Department of Homeland Security conference. One of the speakers was a former congressman that uh, chaired the, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. He told a story about the post-revolutionary period when uh, the officers weren't getting paid and they were speaking of mutiny. They had been successful with the French to drive the British out. They weren't getting paid. They were actually meeting to plan a mutiny and George Washington went to the meeting and he gave a speech and it turned the tide leadership. So I think this is a critical problem for this country, but we're going to have to do some fundamental things that will go against the established organizational structures and authorities that we have to change. So that's how I think about 9-11 and the lessons that came out of that. And I'm really concerned about information warfare. Can we do this before it's critical? Now, I'm the eternal optimist. I think we can. But if you look at our history, we tend to be reactive, not proactive. So I think it's time for the right leadership to step up. Can I just jump in here, Peter? I just want to sort of tail on uh, what the Admiral was saying just now. I think, you know, we, the network nature of this problem is one um, that I think the United States government in particular is still having trouble getting to grips with. Um, you know, there's a great temptation to create agencies and, you know, new authorities, and, and that's good, that's important. That is part of the leadership, I think, um, that uh, the Admiral is talking about here. At the same time, you know, what has changed about the information environment is anybody can penetrate. Um, and anybody can kind of use digital tools and techniques to get under the hood of information uh, campaigns and deception campaigns. And that's where I feel like the investment isn't quite meeting the moment, right? I mean, we've had, we actually had a 9-11 like moment in 2016 when Russia attacked essentially our information systems, right? And, and that has continued since 2018, right? And then 2020, we saw it kind of morph into this kind of synergized threat between you know, local political elites and then you know, China and Russia uh, working weirdly at cross purposes with each other in terms of what their outcomes or expected outcomes were. But in here, in that little period of you know, four or five years, there's also this growing group, a, a social movement um, of citizens who are trying to expose these campaigns, right? Uh, researchers, academics, journalists, um, they're much more empowered now because they have access to satellite technology. They're much more empowered now um, because they have access to you know, different ways to look digitally under the hood. Um, I think that's where some of the investment needs to go, not just sort of your typical paradigm leadership where institutions, and leaders, and decision makers are kind of sitting in a silo, but you invest heavily in this area of citizen activism and citizen journalism. It's a great point. Um, another area of underinvestment uh, is something that both John and the Admiral brought up um, in terms of 
preparing the population, building up resilience through understanding and education. Um, there have been over 450 different uh, think tank, university task force projects on this topic of information disorder. And almost all of them have focused on um, the actions of the adversary uh, changing the um, rules and regulations uh, either on the government side uh, to limit it and or the companies doing more to police their own networks. And yet, you know, 450 looking that way versus a literal handful looking at how do we help the target of this? How do we build up their own capabilities to be resilient? It's, a, it's in my mind, it's a massive imbalance. Um, so as uh, Candace um, very uh, kindly mentioned, I'm someone who um, works in the future and builds uh, stories and scenarios of the future. So I'd like to ask your help on that. Um, we've looked back 20 years, let's look forward 20 years. What does this space look like in 2041? What is the same? What is different? when it comes to information warfare and information threats. Uh, so let's go uh, back around the horn again, Duan. Yeah, um, so um, as a recovering DOD academic, um, I'm gonna answer your question with something that is completely uh, unrelated first, and then I will address your question. Uh, that's what DOD academics do, right? Um, there is a notion about digital education, cyber citizenship. I think those are really important inoculation uh, strategies that we need to build over time. There is no doubt this is something that we need to pursue. And there are a lot of civil society organizations uh, working on the problem set, and perhaps we can build more connective tissue amongst these civil society organizations, NGOs, and essentially like, you know, social movements. Absolutely. So to me, those are like you know public health strategies, uh, but typically they take time to become effective. We also have to think about the immediate symptoms that are hurting our body politics at this point. So, and, and the reason I'm kind of struggling to make this point is very simple. Digital literacy works when we are dealing with a finite set of observations, facts, stories, topics, and whatnot, right? Let me give you a quick data point. In every 60 seconds, Facebook has what? About 200 new posts, right? And the same number of pictures and whatnot. Same goes for Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. The volume of computational propaganda is so massive. I don't think this create critical thinking will be very effective unless we come up with other solution to buy some time to achieve that. Perhaps this is not the right phrase, but herd immunity against this information, right? Now, having said that, let me come back to your you know, question. And um, so I, I like using a lot of abstract nouns. I'm gonna use another one here. And that is what we're seeing is essentially the balkanization of the information environment and it's taking place globally, regionally, and locally, right? So echo chambers, everybody's familiar with this concept. So this is happening locally. But if you look at how China is trying to govern the internet, how Iran is trying to govern the internet, the DPRK and the Kremlin, we also see this split connect taking place globally at the same time. Now, if you think about these two things, it creates a really, you know, wicked problem set, so to speak, because now all the great regimes can exploit our level of fragmentation to create highly entrenched echo chambers that are maintained by rapidly, you know, and, and affordable, inauthentic content, right? And I think this is what, you know, um, Candice talked about earlier. So smaller fringe platforms, you know, private chat groups, encrypted chat apps and whatnot. So now we have this massive level of fragmentation. And then we have this convergence of threats. 
what I'm doing with my you know, work is essentially trying to expose the infrastructure of what I call information pollution. It's not just disinformation, it's phishing attacks, it's malware, right? And also fraud, like you know, uh, like you know, reading websites that essentially automatically download certain like you know, software on your browser, on your computer, and whatnot. I understand this information is all the rage right now, but it's much more comprehensive than just misleading narratives, stories, and etc. Right? So we tend to focus on the tip of the iceberg, right? But unless we tackle this entire industry of information pollution and attack the basic incentive structure of that industry, right? Because traffic is monetization. So not all malign actors are actually malign. They're just trying to make a buck or two by getting more traffic and more monetization. So to me, unless we really tackle this, you know, submerged portion of this industry, I don't think we'll fare well in this fight. And um, let me give you just a very concrete example, and then I'm going to pass it back to you, Peter. Uh, two months ago, the cybersecurity company Barracuda released a new report, right? And they said all these disinformation sites, URLs, and domains also function to mount phishing attacks. So within the span of 12 months, 12 million spear phishing attempts across 17,000 organizations in our country alone, right? So that's what I call the convergence of threat factors, disinformation, cyber attacks, phishing, social engineering, and fraud, right? That's what keeps me awake at night with that very uplifting thought back to you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you. So John, um, I'm gonna tweak the question slightly to this. Uh, what does the um, version, the, the future foreign service officer who's sitting in your role in the, and maybe it's the global engagement center or maybe it's something else 20 years from now, what are they doing different? What are they facing that's different than what you're doing and facing right now? How does it evolve or change uh, for them in the role that you have right now? Sure. So, you know, I, I think first I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately going to, to continue the, the negative or the pessimistic uh, forecasting that, that we seem to be stuck on in, in this discussion, uh, but hopefully be able to turn it around with some sort of optimism when I think about what we could be doing, uh, or those of us in, in my place 20 years from now. Um, right now, you know, looking about what those challenges might be 20 years from now, we really need to address the issue of overall democratic institution building and, and maintaining. Uh, we are seeing disturbing trends in many of our democracies, uh, backsliding on democratic norms, rise of authoritarianism. Uh, we're seeing in authoritarian or near authoritarian states, uh, democratic opposition, opposition groups being, being crushed or facing an immense amount of pressure. Uh, and then we look at how disinformation is being used in those environments today. Uh, and you know, I'll point to you know, Belarus as, as one example. Uh, that we're seeing, uh, that we're looking very closely at for, for pretty much the last year, the last 12 or 13 months, uh, we've noticed, you know, the Lukashenko regime has has increased the pressure, increased the threats of violence uh, against media, independent media uh, in that country, uh, has cleaned out state media, replaced it on occasion with, um, uh, uh, you know, so-called journalists from RT uh, and so on. Uh, and the result is, uh, you know, uh, an information environment or a media environment uh, in which none or very little of the local populace believe anything that's coming from a state mouthpiece. Uh, and yet it continues. Uh, and, and, you know, I've asked people, you know, li living and working inside Belarus, why does that happen? Uh, if nobody believes this, why is the state using its resources to, to continue to fund these, these efforts? And, and the answer I get is pretty striking for the future. Uh, and that's that they're not doing it to inform or misinform or, or disinform a, a public. They're doing it to express in a very audacious way their total control over the information environment. They can lie to you. They can use all of the organs of state communication to put out very evident uh, uh, half-truths or lies. Uh, and there is nothing that you, 
the, the citizen of that country or the opposition figure in that country can do about it. Uh, and that is very demoralizing uh, to uh, individuals, to publics, to, to democratic forces. If the rest of the world, those states that are engaging in, in democratic backsliding or, or tipping towards authoritarianism, if they look at examples like this, uh, they are going to be emboldened. Uh, and 20 years from now, we're going to find that use of disinformation, not just as a tactic of information warfare, warfare but as an anti-democratic uh, weapon. We're going to see that that's much more common. Uh, and I think 20 years from now, uh, the people in my position are going to have to address that more uh, whole of society, whole of government approach to, to malign influence uh, or anti-democratic uh, actions of, of, of adversarial states, not just in a strictly counter disinformation or a strict, strictly information operation way. Um, how, I, I've asked myself, how might we do that? Uh, and you know, I think we've touched on that a little bit in, in some of the earlier questions. Uh, and that's better understanding how to get into those authoritarian environments where a, a state that has total control over the um, majority of the media or communications apparatus and, and outlets, um, how can you still get fact-based narratives uh, into the public? Uh, it's probably not uh, through the means that we're using now, which uh, largely consists of working with the, the bigger social media platforms, working with larger media outlets, uh, supporting um, uh, websites or news services that attempt to reach a whole country or a whole region uh, at the same time. Uh, those are proving, and I think will prove over time, to be too easy of a target for an authoritarian regime to shut down or to block in some way. Uh, so I think 20 years from now, we'll be much more focused on the individual journalist, uh, the freelancers, the stringers, uh, the people who own social media accounts that are that are micro influencers or nano influencers, mm -hmm. who are just informing a couple hundred or a couple of thousand uh, listeners or readers. Uh, and because they're much more harder to be uh, detected and understood and then ultimately blocked uh, by a hostile organization. Uh, so that's the direction that I think will go is uh, you know, fighting disinformation on a very, very local, maybe even hyper local level uh, in order to protect democracy. Candace, what does 2041 look like? Well, I, you know, we kind of have like two parallel tracks that could, you know, diverge from each other. Um, but I think, you know, at the center um, of the movement are kind of three important pieces of the puzzle. One is, um, the rapid proliferation of synthetic media. So that is, you know, sort of uh, you know, cheap fakes uh, and more sophisticated fakes, uh, synthetic voices, synthetic video. Uh, that That is gonna be, I think, a crisis moment um, for some government, most likely the United States. Uh, it would be one of the key, um, I think, most vulnerable uh, countries in the world in terms of how synthetics might affect our information environment. Um, I think that, you know the third, the second thing is virtual worlds that are starting to emerge, um, and the kind of virtualization of information and cultural exchange, even monetary exchange. Something that it's hard for us to understand what that might look like in 20 years' time, but it certainly will affect the um, ability of individuals, in particular, to influence, you know, the more traditional uh, media and information environment simply by virtue of being able to collect uh, more uh, virtual currency and more cachet. Um, and then last but not least is the integration of art artificial intelligence with more sensors, uh, more in terms of the internet of things, means that we're also gonna be looking at the situation where not just states, but you know, tech companies, large organizations, people who have the ability to kind of concentrate capital are going to be able to influence whole populations um, and change, literally change the response uh, to events simply by dint of their ability to surveil uh, the information environment and then leverage that. That's only going to increase over time. So with that being the sort of center, the, the center dynamics, um, you know, track one could be we just continue down this lane and keep crashing into um, these clouds of information pollution until we asphyxiate as a, as a nation. Uh, and, and I think for many democracies, democracies, I think they're facing that, uh, that kind of perilous outcome. Or track two uh, is we force uh, through a combination of you know, civil society and government and uh, other institutional pressures, we force technologists uh, to 
to get real about these threats um, and to open up their algorithms, um, to become more transparent about their content moderation policies, uh, to become more responsive uh, to you know, the needs for a, a cleaner information environment. And, and here, I think we're starting to see the emergence uh, of some very rudimentary tools that you wouldn't expect, which is you know defamation and libel law. That's an area that we're seeing, I think, being tested, for instance, with the big lie uh, and the 2020 campaign uh, with these Dominion voting systems lawsuits and Smartmatic lawsuits against uh, the perpetrators of the big lie who brought the litigation, of course, on behalf of the Trump campaign. I mean, that's a good example of you know quickly using the tools at hand to stamp out bad actors and bad and bad behavior. Um, we don't have to be always so sophisticated. We don't have to just rely on citizens to educate themselves. We've got tools right at hand right now that we put us on a better you know, track um, toward a cleaner, more stable information environment in the future. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, paint us a scene of 2041. Well, Peter, I'd start by uh, looking at my optimistic side, education works. Uh, somewhat of an am amateur historian looking back industrial revolution when we finally adopted universal education, we became the most powerful nation in the globe, most income, most high standard living, so on. So I go back to some of the things that were said earlier about uh, digital literacy and education understanding. You have to understand this environment. Uh, I, I like to refer to the idea of America as being incredibly powerful. It attracts people from all over the world to come to a place where they have opportunity and freedom and they can build, take an idea and build it to an estate and be successful. Um, Democracy is hard. If you think about a fascist society or a communist society with great promise of whatever it is they're going to do, they slip into almost a totally autocratic control society. Now, I'm, I'm apolitical. I'm a military guy. I served Republican administrations and Democratic administrations, and I did it with uh, an apolitical approach. Um, I voted for Republicans and Democrats, and I always tried to maintain that. But now I am a proponent of cyber citizenship in the little organization I'm associated with. And uh, we want to teach youngsters uh, about digital literacy. Uh, how important is it? How do you sort out uh, truth from untruth or misinformation? How do you protect yourself? How do you operate in that environment? And I, and I think it's a challenge for our citizens to understand that, to be able to, to function. So that's the, that's the part that I worry about. Are we going to be able to prove that democracy still works? The Chinese have a model. The Russians have a model. We've seen some of the countries in Europe slip into more autocratic forms of government, are we going to maintain our leadership to sh demonstrate to the world that the idea, idea of America is still there, democracy still works, and we can resist these many attacks in the information domain that's going to try to tear at the fabric of that, that idea. So I go back to how I think about this. It's fundamental education starting in grade school. And so that means we have to teach the teachers, we have to apply the curriculum for the students, we have to expand that thinking over time, and we can't let it turn into a political debate about teaching civic subjects that's an anathema to one political persuasion or another. This is basic survival for the information age, so that's how I think about it. So on the optimistic side, I think it's clear. I said earlier, it's leadership and it's statesmanship. I, I truly believe that. Uh, but it's kind of all up to uh, people like us to be willing to engage and provide the wherewithal, either leadership or source of funding or whatever it is, to cause the, the youth of America to fully understand the environment in which they live. Well said. Um, we're running short on time, so I'd like to ask a question um, and request of each of you give uh, roughly a 30 second response to it. And the question is this, what is one policy change that is doable, a doable, not pie in the sky, doable policy change uh, 
that ought to be implemented to steer towards these more positive futures. And the policy change might be by government, it might be by corporate, you name it. So uh, let's go back around the horn. Um, Duan, what is one doable policy change we ought to implement? The right to audit data and algorithms. To me, there is nothing social about social media. It is traditional media companies. They do audience segmentation. They drive traffic. They sell ads. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to have the right to audit data and algorithms. Great. John. I would like to see more coordinated action by states at a multilateral level to call out disinformation. Individually, we all have growing and immense capabilities to recognize and understand disinformation, uh, but I think we should treat it like we do with cyber attacks occasionally uh, and speak with one voice in the international community and call out foreign disinformation when we see it. Fantastic. Candace. Uh, agree with uh, audits as a requirement for sure. Um, in addition to that, I would just add that platforms release quarterly or uh, regular reports on uh, violations of their um, terms of service and include with that geocoded information, uh, anonymized geocoded information about where those violations are most concentrated around the world. Great, Admiral. Leadership to guide collective security between the public and the private sector to significantly improve our cyber resilience posture. Well, this is a great way to end with um, these fantastic ideas that uh, hopefully um, can and will be implemented. I want to thank all of you for joining us and participating in this very important conversation. Take care. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.